Order, order. We start with questions. The Minister for Women and Equalities, Jeff Smith. Speaker, question one. With, with permission, Mr Speaker, I will answer questions one and six together. Tackling violence against women and girls is one of this Government's key priorities. We are making progress in delivering various cross-government work streams, including the Tackling Violence Against Women and Girls Strategy and the Rape Review Action Plan. Jeff Smith. Thank, thank you. Three quarters of police recorded domestic abuse cases are closed due to evidential dif- difficulties or because the victim does not uh, support further action. Does the Minister agree that Labour's proposal to put rape and domestic abuse specialists in every police force in England and Wales will give women the confidence to come forward and secure more convictions? Uh, Mr Speaker, we will have 2,000 rape uh, specialists across all police forces by by April. And um, in the autumn statement, the Prime Minister announced the Government would provide £2 million of additional funding of the Flexible Fund, which trials one-off payments to victims of domestic abuse, and that fund was made available to victims on 31 January. Little Rachel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, last week I co hosted an event here in Parliament with a delegation from Israel who had first hand experience in the aftermath of the 7th of October. They described innocent women dead and alive who had been raped by terrorists. Hamas desecrated their bodies and even booby trapped them. Mr. Speaker, these acts of sexual violence must be condemned by every institution and individual who cares about women's rights. Yeah. I th- yeah. I th- Mr Speaker, I'd like to thank my honourable friend uh, and her co-chair for organising what was for attendees an extremely difficult meeting. We heard the harrowing accounts of witnesses and family members of young girls kidnapped on the 7th of October and from the first responders who found the bodies of women and girls of all ages with obvious signs of sexual violence, female soldiers found naked with nails and sharp objects shoved into their vaginas. One told of a mother he found with her hands tied behind her backs naked and bleeding from the waist down, shot in the back of the head with a live grenade left in her hand for whoever found her body. Mr Speaker, we must support the courage of these witnesses in giving this harrowing testimony about Hamas's mass-scale perpetration of sexual violence on the 7th of October. We cannot be silent about these atrocities and we must ensure the world does not forget sexual violence shatters lives and devastates communities The UK stands in solidarity with survivors and continues to call for the release of the remaining hostages. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I appreciate the Government has been trying to tackle violence against women and girls, specifically with the Domestic Abuse Act, but unfortunately there were amendments which were not included in that which would have gone further to protect migrant women who are too often still feeling unable to come forward and report abuse for fear of their data being shared and them being detained or deported. So can the Minister commit to reassessing the merits of preventing survivors' personal data from being shared with the Home Office for immigration purposes? Uh, uh, I would say to the Honourable Lady that that is a matter for the Home Office. I support uh, all of the work the Home Office Ministers are doing to tackle domestic abuse. I know that there would have been very good reasons for them not accepting those amendments into, into the Act. We will continue to do all we can. I have just heard from the Safe Minister for Safeguarding that there are uh, concessions that are being made, uh, uh, and so we will continue to work with her and others to tackle uh, domestic violence in all its forms. To the Select Committee, Caroline Oates. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In some instances, there are very good reasons why immigration control should be able to work with forces of law enforcement when it comes to domestic abuse. My constituent, Emma, has been serially abused, harassed, and stalked by a US national who crosses the border with no visa because he doesn't need one to continue his campaign of harassment. Please, will my right honourable friend work closely with the Home Office to make sure that British women are protected? from foreign abusers who have found ways round our immigration system. Uh, my right honourable friend is, uh, is right to raise this. Um, I, please, if she could uh, let her constituent know that the government is doing all it can, and the safeguarding minister has told me that she will write to my right honourable friend so that they can investigate the specific case further. Thank you, Fox. Uh, question number two, Mr Speaker. Minister. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. With your permission, I'll take questions two, five and fifteen together. As of December 2023, 91% of all claims had either received a final decision or were less than six months old. The Windrush scheme has reduced the time to allocate for a substantive casework decision from 18 months to today less than four. This includes making all essential eligibility checks together with a preliminary assessment to make an initial interim payment of £10,000 wherever possible. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. In response to the parliamentary question in April last year, the former Immigration Minister confirmed that 41 of the 6,122 Windrush compensation claimants had sadly died before their claims were settled, an increase of more than 100% since 2021. So can the Minister update us on how many applicants have now died whilst waiting for the government to right the wrongs done to thousands of innocent survivors and their families. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I can confirm that we have been made aware of 53 claimants who have unfortunately passed away, and I want to provide the Honourable Lady with two reassurances. If we are notified that an individual is suffering from a critical or a life-limiting illness, their claim is prioritised. And I also point out that if they do pass away, their family continue to be able to pursue their claim. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Only 14% of 150,000 eligible applicants to the Windrush Compensation Scheme have received redress. So will the government learn the lessons from the Horizon scandal, listen to victims, and companion groups who are calling on the government to lower the burden of proof for claims and ensure that legal aid is guaranteed to all eligible claimants. Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. So far, £75 million has been paid out on over 2,000 claims. Uh, I would just gently say to him that it isn't appropriate to draw precise equivalence with things like the Horizon Scheme, because that involved a judicial process, different facts, different losses, different, different harms. Um, however, we have been making consistent improvements to the scheme, including making it easier for applicants to use, and we have rapidly accelerated the speed at which we make our payments. Janet David. Mr Speaker, victims of the Windrush scandal have experienced huge injustices of destitution, humiliation and varied health issues, as well as delays waiting to be compensated. To make matters worse, they do not currently receive compensation for the loss of private pensions. Will the Minister look into reducing the delays and to compensating Windrush victims for private <coughs> pension losses? Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. We consider each claim on its facts, and no two claims are the same. I'd be very happy to write to her about this specific issue, but I want to reassure her that we don't tr take a blanket approach to each individual and we assess claims individually. Shall the Secretary unleash? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Conservatives have failed the Windrush generation twice now, first by denying their rights as British citizens, then by delaying their compensation, as we've just heard again. Now, Labour would sort out the compensation scheme, re-establish the major change programme and Windrush unit, scrapped by the Conservatives, and appoint a Windrush commissioner to ensure this scandal never happens again. What is the government's plan here? Minister. I find it difficult to accept that a scheme is failing when over 80% of those claims have now received a final uh, decision and over 90% of those claims have either got a final decision or, or are uh, less than six months old. So um, I, I disagree with that. I think it was suggested that we, sh we should be taking the scheme out of the Home Office or perhaps that's Labour's proposal. And I want to remind the Honourable Lady that Martin Levermore, the independent adviser to the Windrush scheme, supported the scheme remaining in the Home Office in his most recent report that was published in March 2022. Thank you, Mr Speaker. No accountability for the failures which are being felt so acutely by so many people who frankly do not have much time left to see justice. Mr Speaker, the Windrush generation and their families helped to build our NHS, but today we see big inequalities in health outcomes. <laughs> Labour's Race Equality Act would include a target to close the appalling maternal mortality gap for black and Asian women. It seems another nine months have passed since the Maternity Disparities Task Force last met. Is that because the Minister for Women and Equalities thinks this is another of her alleged fake problems? 
<laughs> Minister. Um, I, I, I can just say to the Honourable Lady that that is not accepted. And in fact, the Health Secretary made an announcement on maternal services this week. I think it would be appropriate for me to re refer to my colleagues at the Department for Health and Social Care, and I will write to her on this point. Kim Jones. Question number three, Mr. Speaker. Who's Minister? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to respond to the Honourable Lady. I meet the Domestic Abuse Commissioner regularly, and the last joint visit that we undertook to a refuge was specifically for minoritised women where honour-based honor abuse was a specific issue. Uh, the, in, it is important work of the Home Office to look at the specific harms connected with this. One of the things we are proudest of is our forced marriage unit, which has provided support services to over 300 cases in uh, the last year. And also, we fund a national honour-based abuse helpline, which has helped more than 2,500 people in the last 12 months. I thank the Minister for her response. However, Severe UK, based in my Liverpool Riverside constituency and the Domestic Abuse Commissioner, are concerned by the failure of this Government to um, provide a statutory definition of so-called honour-based abuse. So, Does the Minister agree that this will lead to under-reporting and will not provide us with detail of the scale of the problem? I am afraid the Government takes the opposite view. The reason we use the expression honour-based abuse, which has been controversial in itself, is because victims often understand that the best. We also know that victims of honour-based abuse are often the hardest to reach, sometimes the least able to articulate their, their claims and to escape their circumstance. So the reason we keep the definition wide is so that we successfully capture all the various insidious forms that it takes. But I want to reassure her, both the CPS and the Home Office have a working definition that they use that guides investigations and is so far proving effective. Sir Michael Fabricant. One of the most insidious forms of domestic abuse is conversion therapy. It's cruel and it doesn't work. So could my honourable friend give me some indication as to when legislation will be coming forward to ban this. Minister. Um, I can reassure my honourable friend that the government will be publishing a draft bill concerning this very point in due course. Speaker. Yeah. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. There are three key ways that we are helping to get young girls and women into STEM sectors. Firstly, by ensuring that the number of young girls are taking up uh, courses. We have seen a 50 per cent increase in the number of undergraduate uh, STEM courses being taken up by female uh, uh, young uh, women. We are also, then, uh, with a National Apprenticeship Week, uh, seeing 70 per cent of jobs now being accessed through an apprenticeship, which is really helping young women get into STEM careers. And finally, by helping women who have got experience and worked in STEM who have perhaps left the profession to return uh, to STEM uh, the workplace with our STEM Returners project. Speaker, University Technology Colleges are a good place for young women to start in STEM and I welcome the new UTC in Southampton which will provide extra places that Portsmouth UTC is unable to offer. 6,000 girls attend UTCs around the country, of which 82% go on to apprenticeships, university or straight into employment. Most of those are in STEM careers. Will my honourable friend agree that UTCs provide a great start to a career in STEM and the proposal for UTC, UTC sleeves in secondary schools will help more girls into STEM careers? I absolutely agree with her. University technical colleges provide an excellent experience for young people, not just academically, but also in the technical skills that they provide. They have also got excellent links with industry, uh, which provides great work experience for those pupils. I am really pleased that her local young people have such great options for UCT provision. Oh, Jim Shannon. Uh, speaker, can I thank the Minister very much for her answer? Minister, Northern Ireland, uh, I am always encouraged by the number of young ladies and young girls who wish to be involved in the science and technology and mathematics because they can do the job every bit as well as a man do, can do. But is it not important, uh, uh, Minister, to ensure that companies who wish to employ people do more to encourage young ladies to take up the jobs? Thank you. 
Minister. Well, the Honourable Member for Strangford is absolutely right. The government can't do it all. We do need industry as well. But there are some great examples. We've got a £17 million programme uh, scholarship now for AI and data science conversion courses. We've also got the UK Space Agency investing £15 million into diverse uh, workforce streams, particularly for young women, to help them get into the sector too. He's absolutely right. We need to work hand in glove with industry. Barry Sherman. Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. We all know that women take the bulk of caring responsibilities. The Carers Leave Act regulations will come into force on the 6th of April across England, Wales, and Scotland, meaning unpaid uh, uh, carers can take a week of unpaid leave from the workplace, knowing that their jobs are protected as a result. Barry Sherman. The ministerial team knows that it's absolute scandal that in, in all these years of Conservative so-called popular government. We have seen such a bad deal for early years for carers, for women, talented women, legions of them, who want to use their talent at work but are stopped by the highest childcare cost in the world. Well, I would respectfully say to the honourable gentleman that God gave us two ears and a mouth for a reason, and I would encourage him to put his listening ears on to hear the track record of this government. Whether it is improving uh, payment for carers, or whether it's uh, introducing groundbreaking uh, legislation to introduce flexible working from day one, shared parental leave, paternity leave, parental uh, leave. We've now got the kinship carer strategy, which was launched in December, which is looking at a funding model for kinship carers. We have gone further than any government with a plan to improve the lives of carers and value the work that they do. Yeah. SNP spokesperson Kirsten North. Thank you, Mr Speaker. That right to flexible working would particularly benefit workers with caring responsibilities, the majority of whom are women. But unfortunately, the UK government's response to its consultation on flexible working simply doesn't go far enough to provide some of the real practical support needed by many people with caring responsibilities. Last week, Nikki Pound of the TUC told the Women and Equalities Committee that one in three requests for flexible working are denied by employers. So what steps are the UK government taking to really support workers with caring responsibilities and ensure Sure that flexible working is a day one right by default. Uh, well, I speak as a carer myself, holding down a, a full time job, so I know the difficulties that are involved there. And that is why the government passed the legislation for flexible working for day one. We've introduced parental care, which is 18 weeks of leave entitlement for parents. That is on top of the carers' uh, leave regulation, which comes into force from the 6th of April. This government has gone further than any other government in introducing those rights for carers. Jamie Still. Number eight, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this government understands the importance of this issue, and I have recently met with key stakeholders representing disabled people, such as Disability UK and Cross Whitehall colleagues. Jamie Still. Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I have a constituent called Mr. Peter Bodet. He has a severe lung condition which necessitates the use of oxygen. He has mould in his house, the mould is going off his clothes. He can only afford two small electric heaters. I would be very grateful if a minister could meet with me very briefly to discuss this rather difficult situation. Yeah. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And of course, uh, thank my honourable colleague for raising this particular issue. And I speak on behalf of myself and the Disability Minister, where of course we will have a meeting. Mm. We now come to Topical Stuart C. MacDonald. Yeah. Mr Speaker, in light of some of the commentary around the Employment Tribunal's judgment in the case of Professor Miller and Bristol University, I want to clarify that anti-Semitism must continue to be challenged wherever it rises. We have seen people in this country use their views on Israel as an excuse to display anti-Semitism. We have seen this at protests on our streets and we see this in our universities. It is therefore important to underline that this ruling does not change the fact that while academics have the right to express views, they cannot behave in a way which amounts to harassment of Jewish students. Disguising this as discourse about Israel would be no more lawful than any other form of anti-Semitism, and the, gov the government will consider the ruling carefully and will continue to do everything in our power to protect Jewish people across our country. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On Monday, my honourable friend for Livingston hosted a really positive event marking the start of the Football versus Homophobia Month of Action. Yeah. It will ministers join me in thanking all involved in the Football versus Homophobia campaign, which includes Leap Sports and the Thai campaign in Scotland, and offer their wholehearted support for making football a safe and welcoming sport for LGBT people. Yeah. Uh, I thank the honourable gentleman for his question. Of course, yes, we do. We do join him, um, and I would like to pay tribute to the work of the Minister for Equalities, who has been very supportive, uh, supportive of this campaign, as we all are on the ministerial team. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I hear more frequent use of this word microaggression, and uh, as, a, as an engineer, I know micro is something extremely small. It's tiny. In fact, it is one millionth of whatever a standard aggression might be. Uh, Does the Minister have a view on on, on this? Does she recognise it as a new phenomenon somehow? Or is it... And how big of a priority might it be? Mr Speaker, uh, my my honourable friend will be aware that I too am an engineer by training, so we engineers have to uh, stick together. And we are very sceptical when people introduce terms into the lexicon that are not helpful in the real work of tackling serious criminal behaviour. I am not a fan of the term, and he will be pleased to know that the microaggressions training was removed from the government campus uh, prospectus in November 2022. Shadow Minister Ashley Dalton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Under the Conservatives, police recorded rapes have soared to record highs, while convictions have fallen to record lows. It emerged last week that the Conservative Police and Crime Commissioner in Cheshire victim-blamed girls wearing short skirts for this epidemic. Why are these attitudes still tolerated in the Conservative Party? These attitudes are not tolerated in the Conservative Party. I haven't seen the remarks she refers to, um, but I'm sure that we can investigate. However, I will push back on what she has said about uh, rape statistics. The fact is that the year ending March 2023, the Crime Survey for England and Wales showed that 5.1% of adults experiencing domestic abuse in the year, that's a re- reduction, a 5.1% reduction, a statistically, statistically significant decrease compared with the year before ending March 2020. And a fair. Mr Speaker, uh, last month I received a letter from my local NHS trust regarding children's services at South End Hospital referring to women and birthing people going into labour. Can my right honourable friend clarify, is the term birthing people required language under the Equalities Act? Because if not, does she, doesn't she agree it shouldn't be used? Because it's dehumanising, confusing and insulting to many women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, can I thank my honourable friend? This Conservative government, this Conservative Prime Minister have been clear that biological sex matters and language is important too. We have issued guidance to trust because there's evidence that clinical damage and harm can come with the removal of the use of the term woman uh, from literature. I'm very happy to write uh, to her local trust to point that out. Brilliant fellows. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Scott noted that potential changes to the work capability assessment may force disabled people into ill suited employment, and they're worried that these will end up with huge numbers of people being forced to do exactly that. What steps is the Minister taking to ensure, with her Cabinet colleagues, that disabled people aren't given forced into jobs that aren't suited for them? Yeah. 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 Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. and She joined me at the Disability Action Plan event yesterday with many stakeholders welcoming the changes and opportunities to disabled people's lives. Many Many disabled people want to work and will always make sure at DWP we listen to their wants and needs and they'll never be forced into anything that is not suitable for them. Dame Caroline Dianich. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Today at 5pm, women's groups and other community groups in Gosport will be staging a peaceful protest about the Lib Dem Council's decision to completely end all live CCTV monitoring. They're worried about the impact on people's safety. Does the Minister agree with them? Um, uh, I thank my right honourable friend for her question. It is important that people understand that CCTV and street lighting are absolutely important in helping women feel safe uh, on the streets. I fully understand the campaign and I'm glad that she is supporting them. We are doing everything we can in government to reduce violence against women and girls. Mohamed Yazid. 
Mr. Speaker, will the UK government redouble its efforts to ensure the humanitarian needs of women and girls in Gaza are being addressed in line with the UK's commitments under the International Women and Girls Strategy, the Women, Peace and Security National Action Plan, and the International Development White Paper? <laughs> Um, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. I am working very closely with FCDO on this issue. We are very concerned about uh, the events that are taking place in both Israel and Gaza. We want to see the violence end, and uh, he will know all the work that we have been doing around preventing sexual violence in conflicts, for example. We will continue to do everything we can in order to minimise any impact on women and girls. David Evans. Mr Speaker, will my right honourable friend tell me what steps she's taking with Cabinet colleagues to help increase the number of female-led businesses? I thank my honourable friend for for that question. Uh, Female-led businesses often have particular challenges. In the Department for Business and Trade, we work with the British Business Bank in order to ensure that they continue to have access access to finance. We have the Investing in Women's Code. We have a task force for women-led entrepreneurs, and we hope all of these actions together will help improve lives for women in business. Captain Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, will the Minister make a statement about the Patient Safety Commissioner's report out today addressing redress for victims of sodium valparate and mesh? Yeah. 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 Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. She will know that we personally, as a government, commissioned that report for the Patient Safety Commissioner to undertake to look at the options around redress specifically for sodium valparate, but also for those affected by mesh. It's only been published today. We will look at the uh, details closely and then report back to this House. We now come to the start of questions to Prime Minister.